What's up, uh, YouTube? This is Too Raw for TV. All right, a couple things I want to say before I get into this video. Number one, in the previous video I just uploaded, I don't, I don't know why the comments were turned off. I didn't do that. I had comments set as usual uh, to be open. My best guess is because the video showed the picture of the young girl that's the victim of that car crash. Um, the moderator looked at it and just assumed because it's a child that somehow um, it's violating some type of rules. So I saw that they cut comments off when they think that a video is discussing a minor. When in reality, in that video, I'm talking about what transpired with Brett, uh, Britt Reed and why the sports world isn't talking about. But you know, you know how the games they play, okay? So I'm sorry that the comment section was turned off. That's YouTube and playing games, okay? Um, secondly, I want to give a shout out to Percy for his contribution to the channel. Much respect to Percy. Big Percy. Hey, y'all ever seen, um, y'all youngest, y'all know anything about, um, y'all know anything about the Bill Cosby, Sidney Poitier movies in the 70s? You know what I'm saying? The first two was good. You know, piece of the action, it's all right, but it, it's not the same. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, once Bill shaved his beard off, he wasn't the same. The first two, yeah, the first two, Uptown Saturday Night and Let's Do It Again, classics. I'm Little Seymour, and I'm Big Percy. <laughs> I might look at that shit um, tonight. But anyway, let me go further into my top 10 center list. Just do a brief recap at number 10. I had Patrick Ewan, who played uh, in the NBA, mostly for the New York Knicks, between 1985 and 2002. At number nine, I had uh, Artis Gilmore, of course, who, in his combined career with the ABA and NBA, played uh, from 1971 to 1988. At number eight, I had Big George Mikan, whose career uh, started back when there were two leagues, the BAA and the NBL, and his career continued until 1949 when the leagues combined to form what is now the NBA. And of course, he was part of the first uh, dynasty in the NBA, the Minneapolis Lakers, who won five championships all together in the NBA, including three in a row. As a matter of fact, when you combine all of his titles, George Mikan has seven. Okay? Um, actually, yeah, he has seven. So, uh, and then, of course, at number seven, I have Derrick Robinson. Some people have stated to me that they don't agree with that positioning. Some people have him a little higher. Some people have him lower. This is my thing on Derrick Robinson. If David Robinson did not suffer that injury that he suffered, that he sustained in 1996, and he played at the same level for a couple more years, being a 25, 11, 12, three block guy, two steel guy, and still won those championships, he'd be a little higher. Um, 89 and 96, David Robinson, to me, was only behind Elijah Warren overall, like as far as what he could do at that position. Didn't have the heart of Elijah Warren, you know what I'm saying? Um, and also it can be argued, quite frankly, before Tim Duncan arrived, a lot of years he didn't have the best team around him. Come on now. I mean, Vinny Del Negro, Doc Rivers, Avery Johnson, Shit, the best player that was playing with him for many years was Sean Elliott. So, I mean, come on. You got to get an album with some slack a little bit, okay? So, at number six, I have Moses Malone. Moses Malone, let me tell you something. Where I lived growing up, Moses Malone was a motherfucking legend, okay? A legend. All right? Um, he's the first NBA guy I heard about growing up in this area. He was from Petersburg. Petersburg, and I mean, he was just the man around here. Um, 
he's probably, let me think about this before I say it. Let me think about this. Let me think, because I might be wrong. I'm going through my head. But I want to say Moses Malone is the best basketball player or at least the most dominant basketball player to come from Virginia. Let me think about that before I say that. Yeah, I think he is. Um, before LeBron James, he was the best by acclamation, unanimously, the best prep to pro player in the history of the NBA. All right? He's still the second best in my opinion. And you can make a case, in some ways, he's still the most dominant. I mean, a lot, look, I'm not saying LeBron, he's better than LeBron, I'm not saying that. But when you look at Moses and his peak, what he was doing, I don't know if even LeBron was that dominant. And I'm, I'm being honest. I'm being real honest. I'm not shitting on him. People really need to look at Moses' career and how dominant he was in his heyday. Not with the Sixers, but with the Rockets. You know what I'm saying? Uh, to me, he and Bob Pettit are the most underrated players, the most underrated legends in NBA history. Okay? Um, Moses Malone started off in the ABA, I believe, with the Utah Stars. Um, he was a really good ABA player. Uh, wasn't as dominant as Artis Gilmore. When he started off, he was a power forward. And when he started his pro career, he was 18 years old. He was only like 215. He wasn't a big guy initially. He, he grew into, uh, you know, he grew up before our eyes, literally. But, you know what I'm saying, he became a hulking presence down low, man. Um, but let me, let, me, let me go into what his strengths were, okay? He was not what you would call a great pure scorer, per se. Um, he could make, he could knock down uh, a, 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 a 10 to 15 foot jump shot. But he wasn't a guy that was this great post scorer like Elijah Wan or, or, or you know, Kevin Kell with this array of moves. That wasn't him. Um, a lot of times what he would often do is he would just throw up anything. Well, he would throw up a shot, and it would look like it's a shot attempt, but really, he would just throw off the backboard to himself to get a better shot on the rebound. Like, he, and he sacrificed his field goal percentage for that. Um, but he did that. Uh, he he was a workhorse, and he worked for all of those twenty. 9,000 points when you combine the ABA and NBA. 27,000, I think, for the NBA. He worked for all of those points. But he was probably the NBA's best offensive rebounder. Uh, when, you comp when you combine the ABA and NBA, he had over 7,000 offensive rebounds, which puts him well ahead of Artis Gilmore for second place. I think when you combine the ABA and NBA, he 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 uh, edges out Kremble Jabbar as the third leading rebounder of all time, with over seventeen thousand, well over seventeen thousand rebounds. Which, I mean, phenomenal man. He was a phenomenal rebounder. Uh, he was a physical presence. He worked hard. Um, whenever you were playing against Moses, you were going to be banging, okay? When you, you, you went in for a, a, a night, okay? He gave Crimble Jabbar problems because, as I said before, Crimble Jabbar is the greatest center of all time. But Kareem was more of a finesse guy. He did not like going against bangers, especially as he got older. And um, Moses gave him problems. Okay, um, especially uh, during the 83 finals. Um, Moses Malone dominated that matchup with Krim Jabbar. 
but speaking about Moses, let's go into his resume before I talk a little bit more about his earlier years, but going into his resume, he was an NBA champion, 82-83 76ers, he was the 1983 NBA Finals MVP, three times he won the league's MVP award, and that's something that doesn't get talked about as much. Um, he won the MVP in 78-79 and back-to-back 81-82 and 82-83. He was a 12-time NBA All-Star and an All-Star in the ABA in 1975. Four-time All-NBA first team, four-time All-NBA second team. He was on the 1983 All-Defensive first team. He was on the 1979 NBA All-Defensive second team. The ABA All Rookie Team, 1974-1975. Six times he led the NBA in rebounding. Six times, 1978-79, and five consecutive seasons from 1980-81 to 84-85. I believe his six rebounding titles are, I believe, third all time. I think it's the third most. I believe, of course, Wilt has led the NBA rebound the most, followed by Dennis Robin, Moses Malone, and um, I want to say Bill Russell has led it like maybe something like four times. I think Andre Drummond has led the NBA rebounding four times. Something in that vicinity. All right. Um, go further with this. He's on the 50th anniversary all-time team. He's on the ABA all-time team. His number two is retired by the Philadelphia 76ers. That was a long time coming. It didn't happen while he was alive. Uh, his number 24 is retired by the Houston Rockets. Uh, he was named Mr. Basketball USA in 1974. 14 Parade All-American 1973. First team. Parade All-America in 1974. When you combine the ABA and NBA, he scored 29,580 points, or 20.6 points per game. He corralled an astonishing 17,834 rebounds, and averaged 12.2 rebounds per game. To put that into perspective, this is a guy that played until the 94-95 season, okay? That's the same year Jordan came out of retirement, all right? That means that he played about 10, I'd say about nine years, I would say, out of his prime, which would kill your averages. And he still wound up averaging more than 12 rebounds per game for his career. And he blocked 1,889 shots for 1.3 blocks per game. Um, He was a really good foul shooter. Um, He shot 76% from the line, which is very good for a a, uh, center. Um, At one point in time, he was the all-time leader in free throws made and attempted. Uh, But that he has been surpassed in that by Carl Malone. Uh, For his career, he shot about 48% which is not bad uh, for a big man. It's not astonishing, but it's not bad. But a lot of that has to do with the fact, like I said, that a lot of times he threw up shots that were bad shots just to get the ball back to himself to be able to get a better score attempt. Um, So he did sacrifice his field goal percentage uh, to an extent with that. So Moses Malone began his professional career out of high school with Petersburg High School. And um, he played for the school's Crimson Wave. The team went undefeated in his final two years, winning 50 games and back-to-back Virginia State Championships. Malone signed a waiver of intent to play college basketball for the University of Maryland under head coach Lefty Drizel. After the Utah Stars of the ABA selected him in the third round of the 74 draft for the ABA, Malone decided to become a professional. Malone was the was the first high the first high schooler in modern basketball to go directly to 
the pros. He began his professional career with the Utah Stars in the 74-75 season after signing a five-year contract worth $1 million. At the time, Moses Malone was 6'10", but only weighed 215 pounds. Malone started his career off as a power forward until he was able to bulk up enough to handle the rigors at center. As a rookie, he was named an ABA All-Star and earned ABA All-Rookie honors. The Stars folded 16 games to the 75-76 season, and Malone was sold to the ABA Spirits of St. Louis to help pay down the Stars' debts. He played for the Spirits for the remainder of the season. In two seasons in the ABA, Malone averaged 17.2 points and 12.9 rebounds per game. The ABA-NBA merger occurred after the 75-76 season, but the Spirits of St. Louis were not among the ABA teams chosen to join the NBA. Malone had already been selected by the NBA's New Orleans Jazz in a December 1975 pre-merger draft for ABA players of undergraduate age. However, the NBA let them place Malone into the 1976 ABA dispersal draft pool in exchange for the return of their first round draft pick in 1977, which they used to trade for Gail Goodrich. In this draft, Malone was selected by the Portland Trailblazers with the fifth overall pick in the draft. But as you all know, he never played for the Portland Trailblazers. So what happened? Well, the Blazers, however, had also acquired power forward Maurice Lucas in the draft and believed that Malone and Lucas had similar skill sets. Concerns over the team's salary cost compelled Portland to trade Malone to the Buffalo Braves prior to the first game of the 76-77 season for a first-round draft choice in the 78 NBA draft and $232,000. Malone played a grand total of two games for the Buffalo Braves. Because it could not meet Malone's demands for playing time, they then traded him to the Houston Rockets in exchange for first-round draft picks in the 77 and 78 drafts. Now, it was here where Moses Malone shined. During this season, he appeared in 82 games overall for both Buffalo and Houston and finished the season averaging more than 13 points per game with 13 rebounds per game, ranking third in rebounds per game. Malone set a then-NBA record with 437 offensive rebounds in a season. Malone also blocked 2.2 shots per game, the seventh most in the league. During his second season in the NBA, Malone was diagnosed with a stress fracture in his right foot, which caused him to miss the final 23 games of the season. Despite the time missed the injury, Malone led the NBA with 380 total offensive rebounds and finished second in rebounding with 15 rebounds per game. Malone made his first appearance in the NBA All-Star Game in 1978. His scoring improved to 19.4 points per game. I think Trump Robinson led the NBA in rebounding that year, if I'm not mistaken. During the 78-79 season, Malone emerged as one of the top centers in the league after gaining 15 pounds in the offseason. I think this is when Malone was around 250. He averaged 24.8 points per game on a career-best 54% shooting and established another career high with a league-leading 17.6 rebounds per game by winning the NBA MVP award. He again led the league in offensive rebounding, setting an all-time single season record with 587 offensive rebounds. He was voted to the All-NBA first team and the All-Defensive second team. He was also voted by fans to be the starting center for the Eastern Conference in the 1979 NBA All-Star Game. And yes, if you're blinking and looking like a deer headlights, at the time, the Houston Rockets were in the Eastern Conference, as well as the San Antonio Spurs. The Rockets made the playoffs that year, but they were eliminated by the Atlanta Hawks in the first round sweep. Malone averaged 24.5 points and 20.5 rebounds in two games. At that time, the first round was a best of three. The next year, 1979-1980, 
Malone averaged nearly 26 points per game, fifth best in the NBA at 14.5 rebounds, second best in the league. He was named an All-Star for the third straight season and was also named to the All-NBA second team. In the opening round of playoffs, Houston defeated the San Antonio Spurs in a best-of-three series. Malone registered 37 points and 20 rebounds in the deciding third game, leading the Rockets to a 141-120 victory. In the conference semifinals, the Rockets lost in a sweep to the Boston Celtics. In 1980-81, Malone led the NBA with 14.8 rebounds per game, and he finished second in scoring, 28.8 to Adrian Dantley, who averaged 30.7 points uh, that year. Um, this was the first year that the Houston Rockets were moved from the Eastern Conference to where they are now currently in the Western Conference. Houston and Sacramento Kings tied for the second place with identical 40 and 42 records. And they both uh, made it to the uh, Western Conference Finals. Malone carried his team to the 1981 Finals, but lost four games to two to the Boston Celtics. During the following season, 81-82, Moses Malone had his greatest NBA season. He averaged 31.1 points per game with nearly 15 rebounds to win his second league MVP award. I'm trying to speed through this a little bit faster. Uh, the next season, Malone, before the next season, I should say, Malone was traded to the Philadelphia 76ers. Uh, Philadelphia was a great team led by um, of course, the immaculate and great Julius serving. But one area that Philly was a little weak at was down low. Uh, they always had pretty good guard. They had really good guard play. Of course, the phenomenal Julius serving. But one of the areas that always hurt them was at center. Now they have the league MVP. And the 1982 76ers romped through the league. Um, 65 and 17 during the regular season. Um, I think they went 12 and 1 during the playoffs. One lone loss to the Milwaukee Bucks, who were a really good team, by the way. And they swept the Lakers in the finals, four games to none. And Moses Malone uh, just devastated, I mean, just destroyed Krim Jabbar in that series. I think he out rebounded him something like 72 to 30 in four games. Not that Kareem did a terrible job, it's just that Moses Malone was not to be denied that year. Now, surprisingly, the very next year, I think they went something like 50, I think they went 56 and 26, um, the, the Sixers. Uh, but a team that was expected to perhaps repeat, they surprisingly lost in the first round to the then New Jersey Nets. Can't remember the spread anymore, but they lost to them in the first round. By that time, I think the first round had expanded to a best of five. I think by that time, they expanded to a best of five. Now, this is one of the worst decisions by any franchise in the history of the NBA. Okay. <clears throat> I think it was prior to the 86-87 season, I believe it was. Or was it prior to the, no, I think it was prior to the 86-87 The perception was that Moses Malone was on the downside of his career. But this time, he wasn't old. He was 31, I think. However, he had a lot of mileage on him. Um, his level of play had declined. Uh, he was now a guy averaging more like 22 points, 11, 12 rebounds. He wasn't the dominating 31 and 15, 16 guy that he was before. So they kind of thought that, you know, he's done. He's going to be done soon. So they traded him basically for uh, a bag of checks and some muffled bologna. 
And uh, in reality, Moses Malone had several more seasons playing at a very high level. He played at a very high level for the Washington Bullets. I can't remember each season off the top of my head, but it was something I know it was double doubles. Uh, he had great seasons playing for the Atlanta Hawks later on. He was a 20 and 10 guy, even into his mid 30s. And he had, I think, at least one or two good seasons playing with the Milwaukee Bucks when he was in his late 30s, still averaging something like uh, 18 and 9 or 18 and 10. So I think that that was a bad decision that they made at that time. And that put the Philadelphia 76ers organization behind for many, many, many years until Allen Iverson, when he finally had teams sufficient around him, they had been dragged that franchise from obscurity back to relevance and prominence in the Eastern Conference in the late 90s, early 2000s. Now, Moses Malone eventually became a journeyman. He had one more season later on playing with the Sixers, I think it was 1993. And he finished off his career playing with, this, I think, the, uh, I think it was this, the San Antonio Spurs. I think it was. The Spurs or the Rockets? Uh, it might have been the Spurs, I think. I think it was the Spurs in 94-95. And he called it a career after 21 seasons. And uh, most of them, of course, is a bona fide no-brainer. Naismith, uh Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame uh, member, uh, and um, Moses Malone was blessed to enjoy 20 years of retirement. I still remember it. I think it was September of 2016, I think it was, or it might have been 15. I can't remember exactly which year it was, but I remember Moses Malone was supposed to appear in a golf tournament. Let me see what year it was. I remember being in September. It might have been 2015. Let me make sure. Yeah. September 2015. Moses Malone was supposed to appear in a golf tournament. And I think it was in Norfolk. And um, I think he was late. That day, he was not answering his phone. Nobody was able to contact him. And um, when they entered his hotel room, he was dead. And they found out that uh, the autopsy showed that he had died, basically, of, of heart disease. He was 60 years old. And I think that his loss is still felt to this day by the NBA family the amount of respect that his peers had for him. Um, I can't I can't even convey into words. Um, you could even honestly give him some credit for Charles Barkley getting the most out of his talent because it was him that got on Charles Barkley for being lazy. Um, earlier in his career, Charles Barkley weighed usually around 285, 290, and he was playing mostly off of talent. But Moses was telling him, look, if you don't get in shape, you're never going to be consistent. You're never going to be at the high, at playing at your best level consistently. And you may not have a long career. And uh, he was the one that worked with, with Charles Barkley, lose all that weight, get in shape. And for most of the rest of his career, until maybe the very end of that Rockets career with Paul Barkley, we kind of regained a lot of weight. But for the mo most of his career, Charles Barkley stayed in really good shape. He was around 250, 260. Um, but he was a no-nonsense guy. He wasn't the most eloquent person, but he got his message across. And when you talk about, when I talk about players today not giving their effort, giving their all, even though they make all this exorbitant amount of money, Players like Moses Malone come to my mind about guys that came out there and worked their ass off. This guy worked his ass off to be what he was. He, he, if he had the mindset of some of these other players today, eh, he could have still been a borderline French Hall of Famer. He could have averaged 20 and 10. But no, he wanted to be a superstar. He wanted to be the best player in the NBA. 
he wasn't given the best uh, gifts physically. But in the late 70s, early 1980s, Moses Malone was the best player in the NBA. And uh, he doesn't get his just due as to how great he really was. So at number six, I have Moses Malone. 